Luke 23, 22, we find out a little bit about this man. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. Jesus was not the only condemned man that day. Now, we only think about Jesus on that day, but there were two other men that were led out with him. And that walk from Pilate's prison, Pilate's prison to Golgotha that morning, was made by three men. Jesus and two criminals. Which means the two criminals had the best chance to see the intense emotion of this crowd. As well as the reaction of Jesus towards the hostility of this crowd. Now usually at a crucifixion, when people would be let out, the crowd would usually be pretty small. There might be a few family members, there might be some close friends, but usually the, the crowd was not very big, but this time this crowd was huge. And they were from all walks of life. You know, they were religious leaders, they were shop owners, they were the aristocrats, they were the rich, they were the poor. The only thing they seemed, that seemed to unite these people that day was their hatred for Christ. The situation had a huge impact on these other two criminals. In fact, both of these criminals joined in with the crowd and they both start mocking Jesus. We see this in Matthew chapter 27 and 38 and 39. It says this, Then the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads <coughs> and saying, You who destroy the temple, build it in three days. Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. But then we go on down and we look at verse 44. And it says this, Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So these criminals that were hanging on this cross with Jesus that day were saying the same things to Jesus as the crowd were. They were chastising Christ even though they were hanging with him. Now, Here's something to understand. This man is one of these criminals that was chastising Christ on their walk to Golgotha and even after they got hung up on the cross. This is the same man who would later cry out for sympathy from Christ. And he is the same man who feels quite justified in condemning Christ right now. It's amazing how this guy changed. We're going to take a look at that. The crowd was yelling, if you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. Now both criminals joined that chorus. They all, they were joined in that chastising. And we don't think about that very much, but we see it in the scripture that they did that. And as we look at this criminal, don't be under the impression that somehow he is better than that other thief that's on the cross who did not ask for forgiveness. This criminal is just as guilty and is, and is right in the tip of the action of of chastising Jesus. So how do we summarize the life of this thief? This thief made a living by taking what was not his. The scripture tells us he was a robber. So he robbed people. He knows he's guilty because he's been condemned to, to be crucified. Yet he still has energy to hurl insults at Jesus. You know, what did this man have to offer to Christ? Absolutely nothing. Except sin, guilt, and shame. But he has also been publicly condemned just like Jesus was. He also faced Pilate and was found guilty. He, he has treated Jesus exactly the same, one, the same way as everyone else. Yet somewhere along the way, his heart changes. The criminal starts to realize that Jesus is not someone to be insulted and mocked. But Jesus is someone to be trusted. Now, when you come to realize that fact, it transforms this man. It transforms him from a criminal who is condemned into a criminal who confesses. Now we don't 
know exactly when this criminal had a change of heart. But we do know that when this man sees all that is happening, and when he thinks about his situation, that somewhere along the line, somewhere, a huge transformation took place and started taking place in the heart of this criminal. And it happens to the point that instead of mocking and insulting Jesus, that he actually begins defending him. When we look at here at Luke 23, verse 41, it says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's gone from chastising Christ to now defending him. And what and that is when he speaks the most important words of his life. When he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Of course, we know the response of Christ. When Jesus tells him, As surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This criminal has come to a point of realizing that Jesus is his only hope. Therefore, he confesses his need of salvation to Jesus. Now, we need to be honest with ourselves. If Scripture had not told us the response that, the response that Jesus had to that criminal that day, would we have actually believed it was a true confession? You know, when you hear me talk sometimes that you have followers of Christ that are Christians, and sometimes you have Christians that are by Christians by name only. We would have probably thought that this man that was hanging on the cross that day that said this to Jesus was probably just a Christian by name only. But we see that Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew that his confession was true. Amen. And Jesus told him today, you'll be with me in paradise. You know, can someone change that quickly? These are the sort of questions that we hear about people who suddenly confess their sins on their deathbed. Well, we might question them. We might say, well, did they really mean it? But to me, a confession on a deathbed is the most honest that there is because they have absolutely nothing to gain. This thief here knows he is accountable to God. He knows his life has not been what it should be. It has been nothing but trouble. This man realizes that Jesus is the answer and he is the only answer. Yeah. Here's a man whose eternal life is actually sitting right on the very edge and he, you know, he's not going anywhere. He's been down to that cross like Jesus. So he's not going anywhere until he dies. And so he calls out the only one who could help him. They could give him help and also give him hope. And that fact helps us to understand a very <coughs> significant truth. Jesus has made coming to him very simple. You can't get much more simple than what that thief on the cross did that morning or that day. That thief on the cross defended him and then he looked and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That was simple. We can come to him at any time, in any circumstance. No matter what our life has been like, we can come to him. And the greatest thing of all that, that they found out on that cross that day, he is there for us. Grace is a free gift. Grace is, the, is what the sacrifice of Jesus is all about. It's through God's grace that Jesus died on that cross that day for us. Amen. And it's for this reason that Jesus is hanging on that cross in the first place. Because of the grace of God. You know, I think about it all the time, my four sons. Who do I love enough? Whether here in the church or out in the world, that I would let my son, one of my sons, be nailed to a cross, knowing that he would die. 
I love you all very much. But I don't know if I can sacrifice my son for you. I'd be willing to sacrifice myself, but not my son. Now, I was told, Bryce told me today about a little bit about that training that they went to about protecting the church. I may have just messed up. Because like, apparently part of it is somebody needs to stand in front of the pastor to protect him. You might not want to do it now. But one thing I did find out as we were talking, I'm, I'm going to have to lose some weight so I can become a harder target. <laughs> because if you're not a big guy like me, it might take two of you to stand in front of me to protect me. But grace is free. Grace costs us nothing. Our salvation costs us nothing. No, Jesus once said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. It's a promise that applies to those who think they have it all together, and it's also a promise to those that don't have it all together. You know, we are running a race. Paul tells us that we are running a race. Some of us are running a race that's going to lead us straight to hell. Some of us are running a race that that's given to us by, by God. But the thing is, when we're born, that gun goes off and we start this race of life. And at some point in our life, we've got a decision to make. Do I want to continue on this road? Or do I want to stop and get on a different road and start another race? Now, I kind of envision when we accept Christ our Savior that he's sitting with us there with the starting pistol. And as soon as we accept him, he fires that starting pistol and we start running a different race. A race towards heaven. A race is not always easy. But it's a race that leads to eternity. Now, this criminal here that we talked about this morning. I know he probably didn't fully understand theology. But the thing is, he didn't have to. No. He also didn't have very good credentials, but he didn't have to. Because that doesn't matter. Our credentials, our theology doesn't matter to God and Christ. What matters is the fact that we go to God as we forgive our sins and accept Christ as our Savior. That's all it is. The thief did it on the cross with just a few words. But now this thief has hope. Now he knows that he has not gone beyond the grasp of God. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are, what you've done in your life, you are not beyond the grasp of God. God can save you wherever you're at. I hear it all the time when people say, well, I need to get better before I accept Christ. This thief never had a chance to get better. Better than he accepted Christ and he received salvation. We cannot get good enough to, to be saved. God doesn't care about our past. He cares about the decision that we make to accept the Son of our, as our Savior. You know, with this thief, he could have easily sat up there and said, well, I'm too sinful. But he didn't. He realized that Jesus was the Son of God. He realized that Jesus was dying for his sins. And this thief accepted him on that cross. I don't know if, if you've seen it up to this point, but there's a stark contrast between the approach of the criminal at this time and the approach of the disciples at this time. The, so far, the disciples have been acting like the end of the world has come. They have basically lost hope in everything. They don't see anything good happening about how the death of Christ and as a real result, they have left Jesus. If you remember when Jesus was arrested, they scattered like a covey of quail. But later that day, when that thief was hanging on that cross with Christ, he had a completely different train of thought. He had a train of thought of salvation. This is the Son of God. 
that things will get better. Well, later in the day when Jesus died, the disciples got to, they started hopelessly grieving, thinking that the ministry was over with. Where do we go from here? Some of you talked about going back to become fishermen again. Well, we know that's not what happened, though, in the end. They thought the end, they thought the end has come, that there is no more. All that they had dreamed of was now lost. <coughs> as far as the disciples were concerned, there was nothing beyond that moment. But that is not how the thief saw it. <coughs> and the thief looks to Christ. He knows that death will not be the end. Instead, it will lead to a glorious new beginning. This thief knew something the disciples did. He knew because of what Christ told him on that cross that the moment he died, he would be with, he would be with God in heaven. Jesus says, a he said, Jesus promised him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say a week from now, a hundred years from now, or a thousand years from now. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paul even says, to be apart from the body is to be with Christ. Amen. There's some denominations that think we're going to soul sleep, that our, sleep, that our soul goes to sleep when our body dies. If that's the case, the scripture's lying to us. Because that's not what the scripture says. Jesus did not lie to us when he told the crowd, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paul did not lie to us when he said to be apart from the body is to be with Christ. Now this thief, he was transformed by the grace of Jesus. Now this criminal knew his shortcomings. He knew his life was a, was a mess. Yet in the blink of an eye, it all changed. <coughs> when he says, and then Jesus made it clear to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today, that thief saw God face to face when he died. He was washed. He was renewed. <coughs> and you know what Jesus also gave him? He gave him a front row seat to Jesus' homecoming into heaven. No longer will the state be defined by his actions. No longer will he be treated as a criminal. And that also goes for us. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we will no longer be defined by our previous actions. We'll no longer be treated as a criminal. But now, like the thief, you'll be treated as a precious child of God. The nice thing about this promise to this thief, now the scriptures tell us that when we accept Christ as our, as our Savior, we become a new person, a new creation. All that we have done in the past is gone and wiped out, been erased from the books. The moment this thief accepted Christ as, as a Savior, Everything from that point past, past was gone. Even though man still killed him, God saved him. That's a great comfort to me. I hope it is to you too. But heaven been promised to a man who deserved to be. This, where does this thief really deserve to be? He deserved to be in the pits of hell. But instead, because of Jesus and that cross, this thief gets to spend eternity with God. This criminal actually gets to see what the disciples have totally missed. The crucifixion is not the end of the story. Rather, it is an essential component of our eternal salvation. There is more to come. And a lot more. It's hard for us to understand sometimes. But when this body dies, it's just the beginning. The beginning of another journey. The beginning of eternity with God and Jesus. First in heaven and then on earth with a thousand year reign. And then one of these days when that thousand year reign is over, 
is eternity on a new earth with God forever. So, how do we respond to this? How do we respond to these verses here? What these verses makes us realize is that our interest into God's family is not based on our performance. Because I guarantee the performance of this thief was horrible. But because of the blood of Christ, he received salvation. You know, it doesn't matter if our past performance was good, bad, or maybe exceptional. It doesn't matter. The good person that doesn't accept Christ is going to help like the bad person that doesn't accept Christ. And the same thing goes the other way. The bad person that accepts Christ is going to heaven just like the good person that accepts Christ is going to heaven. God does not give us a distinction between good and bad when we accept Christ. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we become a child of God and we're all equal. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us any less. He wants us to become His child. He wants us to accept the blood of Christ. Oh, Jesus looked past the life of crime that this thief had had. You know, it's more than just that he was a thief. He hurt a lot of people. If you ever been robbed, it's a horrible feeling. Not only did this robber steal from people, but he damaged people. He hurt them by taking their things. All that was forgiven when he accepted Christ. You know, Jesus does not point out how broken we are before we come to him. He just wants us to come to him. No matter if we're broken or if we're not broken, rich or poor, there's a table for everybody. I mean, a place in the table for everybody that accepts Christ as their Savior. No matter, we can live an exemplary life. We could work the soup kitchens every weekend. We could donate money to all kinds of charities. But no, all that money that we spend, all that work that we do does not have anything to do with the equation of grace that God gives us for going, for accepting Christ our Savior. All you have to do is like this thief. Humble yourself before God. Ask Him to forgive you your sins. And accept the fact that Jesus died on that cross and shed his blood for you. You know, I got to thinking about what this, the testimony that this thief could have had. You know, he would have said, Jesus, if you're really the son of God, get yourself down. Just think if this thief could have gotten down. <coughs> the story he could tell, the, the witness that he would have. Jesus changed me while I hung on the cross. Imagine that story. But that also tells us, again, maybe Jesus didn't bring this thief off the cross to tell his story. But through God's word, we're still here today, 2,000 years later, about how this thief accepted Christ from the cross. He had nothing to offer God. He was up there to die. But God saved him by his grace. Now, you can almost say it was a waste not to bring that thief down, but no, let me think about this. Saving a bad person. And I've heard people say this before. When somebody that's lived a bad life all their life and they said Christ, I've heard this actually being said. What a waste of God's grace. Why have someone who isn't going to be any real use 
to God anyway. But isn't that the point? Jesus doesn't save us because we're useful. Jesus saves us because of his grace. And it doesn't matter who you are. God loves his pastor just as much as he loves the worst sinner out there in the world. I'm not loved anymore. You as Christians are not loved anymore. The only difference is we're going to heaven. We've made a point to accept God's grace. We've made a point to accept his love and what and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. <clears throat> Though we all sin. Sometimes pretty big ones, but we all sin. Sometimes even as Christians, we bring shame and guilt upon the name of Christ. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we stagger through life as a Christian. But Jesus will still be gracious and he will not love us any less. Please stand this morning. We have our invitation.